We are back. New York City baseball, past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And the host of the show, well, there are two hosts. Robert Denninger is not here. Marty Mert Rose is. How are you, sir? I am fine, Ralph. Uh, just uh, another lovely 90-degree uh, day in Florida, except, uh, you know, for, that's except not bad. for the... It, it's the humidity. <laughs> I wonder how that, that is. Um, yeah, it's that... pretty high also. It actually rained today when the eclipse was supposed to go down, you know? Uh, yeah, if, it, if it was any of it. not here, not here. If it was clear, if it was clear, we would have gotten uh, 90, 91% because because someplace in South Carolina was 100%, so that's not that far from here. So we, we would have gotten 91%, but it was overcast and it was raining for a while. So I... Didn't see so it. a difference, and you didn't burn your eyes. That was a good. Yeah, um, yeah, it did. You know, it did. Yeah, it got dark for a while, but that's about it. You know. Yeah, uh, we're supposed to be joined tonight by Jim Thrift, who's returning to these airwaves and uh, is tardy. That happens. Jim is a has a rare baseball background of being both a scout, a player, minor league player, and um, a player development guy. He was a manager in the Med organization, um, super scout for Cincinnati, uh, a lot of lot of experience that uh, is fascinating for me to draw on about how the inside of the game of baseball works. And I have a few questions for him about scouting and player development. Uh, we're waiting for him. Robert's not here tonight, so Mert and I are going to take the opportunity until Jim joins us to talk a little Mets. And we're going to try to keep it positive because uh, – all things considered, they, as far as I'm concerned, they were able to rid themselves of a lot of high-salary guys that won't be coming back. And um, I appreciate the fact that with the market being very light, because there are few teams in contention. I mean, as an example, the Dodgers are running away from it, so um, th that leaves no race whatsoever uh, for, for the um, championship of the West, and I don't think teams like to go out on a limb and buy a lot of, of players down towards the end if they're only competing for like a second wild card or a wild card position, not going to give up draft choices unless they have more than um, just a chance uh, of getting into the playoffs going for them. So it was a soft market. Uh, Mert, I'd like you, if you would, to kind of analyze what we got um, do you think they gave up the right players? Do you think it was a good idea that they kept Cabrera? And um, what do you think of the chances of him being like a Zobrist guy, super sub, uh, versatile guy next year? I'll let you uh, orate, if you would, my dear friend. Okay. Um, yeah, I think Cabrera's still on the block. If anybody is interested, I think he's definitely available. But um, since he can play second or third, um, they do have, I think, an $8.5 million team option on him for next year. So, um, you know, in all likelihood, uh, they'll probably bring him back um, and I, I, 
if they do, then I doubt Reyes comes back. So, um, that 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 re, that remains to be seen. But um, as far as uh, what they got for all the guys that they gave up, um, they didn't get much. Uh, the uh, the pitcher that they got for Granderson. Uh, it, he made it into the top 30, they said, the, the Mets' top 30 uh, prospects. But, right. you know, how, ma- how, many, how many of the top 30 prospects on one team are really that good when you get right well, down to it? You when know? it comes down to it, one, two players in the top 30 on any given team, maybe three, Will be a contributing member of uh, of the team someday, of any given team yeah. someday. Yeah. So it is a crapshoot, yeah. but got to give Alderson credit for uh, um, assembling a bunch of guys, former uh, general managers, the former general manager of the Dodgers. Can't think of his name. Is a super scout for them. Um, Determining which of these guys are going to make it and um, is obviously the key, and that's why I wanted to get into Jim Thrift's head a little bit tonight mm-hmm. um, yeah. about that. Um, yeah, it's a, a long shot. You and I talked during the week a little bit about our amazement that the Dodgers went for Grandison, and why was that? Is it just because he's... They figured there's a clubhouse guy with a good, solid guy that um, – because they're basically a young team. Um, Well, uh, they sent down Jacques Peterson, who is not having a very good year. So, um, so, you know, Grandison took his spot. Um, So – But let's face it, Grandison wasn't having a very good year for for the Mets, so – well, I mean, if you if you throw out the first two months of the season when he was absolutely horrible, after that he was pretty decent. He's got over twenty home runs. Um, you know, he, he he can even at his advanced age, he can still play center field, even though they they put him in left. No, I'm not taking. But those first two months were the months that were setting the tone for the way the season went. Too. Um, yeah. Sometimes play. I don't. I, he was horribly disappointing. But um, at that, but as you say, he can still play defense. He surprised me a little bit when they put him in center field, and he and he was doing well. Um, next year, center field. Are you talking about now? You're platooning Nemo, who I like. Uh, I mean. I know he's not going to be a, any great uh, um, long-term major leaguer. So what what do you I, like I about like his me? attitude? I like his hustle. Um, yeah, I but doing him with Lagars, is that going to? Are they going to look to upgrade in the offseason? I I I hope so. Um, I'm I'm thinking I'm hoping to tell you the truth that they try to get Bruce back because if they do then you know Conforto can play center on a regular basis. Um, I I mean, Nimmo is a nice kid. He's a good fielder. He can run pretty well. But I don't think he's much of a hitter. I, especially, you know, he's got no power. You know, he can run a little bit. But um, to me, I, I think he's a little lacking – to be a regular everyday major leaguer, even even platooning with Lagaris. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure about Lagaris either. He seems to get hurt every year, and Riddle, yeah. He, yeah, and you know, if he hits 270, that's a lot for him, and he doesn't really have any power either. Um, a little speed, either batting ninth, which. Um in DH situations, um, I don't know. Yeah. It's just they're sorely lacking in speed. 
Hey, here's a question I want to ask you, Mert. You got uh, Rosario, obviously a great prospect, super fielder, uh, mm-hmm. has a few bad little uh, glitches once in a while, took a couple of hops and a ground ball that cost him a run. He's got um, that double um, that double, double crow game. hop or whatever you want to call it that, yeah. that cost him um, – it was a, like a fairly routine ground ball by Gordon. I know Gordon can get down the line, but, you know, he should have thrown him out. But that yeah. double clutch cost him, uh, cost, cost him a, a run. It cost right him the game. That, that well, that, that, that too. Yeah. Well, uh, um, <laughs> if it wasn't that, something else would have cost him the game. I thought I had a good line. You said, good win. And I said, Good win is when they don't get it, when no one gets hurt these days. <laughs> that it's all the yeah. Matter. Well, win, lose. well, that's that's uh, the latest one on the DL. In case you didn't hear that, I <laughs> I didn't. I I almost <laughs> said that is a throwaway joke, but yeah, they uh, put Matt's on the DL today, and the uh, uh, immortal uh, Malone is back, and he uh, he's taken. He's taken Matt, you know, the guy that was DFA'd that they picked up right. earlier in the year, and then he went on the DL, and then he rehabbed, and now he's back, and he's going to take Matt's spot, uh, okay. I guess, tomorrow, probably. It's, it's horrible that it's um, August, and we're, we're looking at it as just maintenance to get through the season and hoping that no one gets hurt. Um, <laughs> they got rid of Rivera. They, they, uh, the Cubs picked him up, and I think he can help a good team. I think, still think. Oh, for sure. Be, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. The best to have. You were right all along. He never really did hit. He never did seize the moments. And there was a time they were so down on Darno that mm-hmm. um, he could have easily um, turned heads and didn't. And uh, yeah. Darno didn't well, have the worst year. He had a, had a better year. He's having a better year than, than he had last year. And ironically, he shows me flashes of good defense. Um, yeah, throwing well, guys. Uh, um, yeah. It happens. Well, so, yeah, so. I don't know. I, at least we'll get a chance to see what. Who's that? Pilecki? Yeah, Pilecki's, um is Well, back. he's up now. It looks like they're alternating Darno and Pilecki now every day, which is a good idea because you got to see what you have in, in Pilecki anyway. I mean, I don't think much of him personally, but who knows? I mean, he had a pretty decent year in Las Vegas, so um, we'll get a chance. These guys are all going to get a chance to play, the, the young guys now the rest of the way. And, you know, we'll get a, an idea of, you know, whether they're real major leaguers or not. Uh, this this is the time. We're going to find out. You know. Dominic Smith, what's your first impression of him? He came up a week or so, two weeks ago. Maybe. He, uh, yeah, well, uh, looks like he, he's a pretty good fielder uh, around the bag. Uh, and um, um, he... He's started to uh, started to hit a little bit better. When he first came up, um, he, he wasn't looking very good at the plate, but um, I think think he uh, hit a, a homeward yesterday, I believe. And uh, I think he's looking a little better, but you know, uh, he, he has you have to give him some time. Um, I think um, uh, Rosario. Impressed right away, you could see it uh, with a shortstop. You could see it a little quicker. Um, so, but 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 with Smith, um, he is he is good around the bed. I have to say that from what I've seen so far. Um, you know, whether he's a major league hitter, we'll have to wait and see. Because uh, you really can't go by you know Vegas numbers that much because they're inflated. Um, so, I mean, he, he did have only 16 homers the whole year in Vegas, which you would think, you know, for a first baseman, you should 
have a few more than that, but uh, we'll see. Uh, a little, little early to, to tell. Hit last year. Let's put it that way. Okay. So uh-huh. Some guys develop power. Line drive hitter will take him. Let me go back to the outfield. I, I left something hanging. Do you okay. think the Mets think enough of Conforto as a center fielder to um, not make a deal? Um, it surprised me when you said that because I'm starting to think of him as a good, solid corner outfielder. But uh-huh. um, uh, he's a good arm. He doesn't um, – he no. takes good roots to the ball. He's just not – really all that fast. I think that's... Um, that's okay. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. He'd definitely be a better corner outfielder than a center fielder, but um, I just, you know, I just don't see uh, Ligaris and Nimmo as as a, as an everyday platoon out there. Um, if they could get a better center fielder, I think they should do it. Then again, if they could get Bruce, I would not mind playing Conforto in center because he's shown he could play there. And you got to, you know, you got to score some runs somewhere. So, um, you know, you need guys to, to, yeah. So, especially, you know, with the pitching, I mean, these guys, all, all these guys that we had great hopes for, are hurt every year. I, this I whole know. thing is the, the whole thing's the falling two and apart. And a half years, the last two and a half years since that game that Blevins and Darno got hurt in the same inning. Blevins hadn't given up a damn thing. They um, a couple of four, maybe four weeks they had him. He gets hit in in, in uh, with a comebacker. In his arm, he's he was gone for the major part of that season. Um, started a string of injuries with Darno, and we've talked about this before. I'm a great believer in a guy can go downhill. He could be um, injury free for a long time, career going well. One injury ends up with a player compensating, as an example. You hurt your left knee a little bit. You compensate. You end up hurting your right ankle as a as a result. Now yeah. you're compensating for the right angle, and your left hip goes bad. And uh, I've seen that sort of stuff happen. Um, I can't trace Lagares' injuries. Um, so well, he gets a lot of them from diving or diving for balls. He's gotten hand injuries a couple of times when he when he when he dives for balls in the outfield. He has thumb ligaments or wrist or hand or something. That's that's what he right. seems to hurt all the time. Well, you know, that spectacular me, catches. You have to mention that anybody who dives into first base, given the fact that it ends up slowing you down, <laughs> the dive itself is not as fast. Is running through the tape type thing, and risk, uh, takes that risk or dives into home plate again with a catcher armed, you know, like for combat, and you're yeah. diving in with your hands and what have you. I don't understand. I think the game, if anything is missing, it's the skill, the base running, sliding skills that guys had where they could take all different routes to the bag, hook slides this, hook slides that. Now you see guys diving in with sliding gloves and ending up with, you know, with ligament damage to their hands and what have you. I think that's just stupidity. And it's not just the Mets. It's all the baseball. Um, But, you know, diving for balls, um, that's why I like to see Ligaris out there because he does dive for balls yeah. Um, yeah. In, yeah. in one respect. You, you know, you don't want to see him hurt, of course, but yeah. um, you like to see that hustle. Um, how about a report card the year on Cespedes? From oh, boy. Very disappointing. 
Um, I, I know he missed some games, but I, I don't I don't know what this guy's problem is. He he hustles it seems when he wants to. Um, he doesn't show a lot of desire out there. Um, may, maybe I don't know. Maybe it's because the team is going nowhere. Would he hustle more if they were in a pennant race and the games were more meaningful? Maybe. Right. Um, but, you know, there's already guys here, you know, I mean, not here. There's already guys that, that I'm hearing uh, on the air saying, oh, it was a bad signing, they, they should have never signed them, blah, blah, blah. But, well, you know, last year, the way the situation was, they had to sign them. There wasn't one person that was saying, don't sign him last year. Now, right. all of a sudden... Do you remember how yeah. he played when he came over the year before? And how he oh, absolutely, yeah. Carried that on his back. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, he, uh, uh, he just do you doesn't... Think that some guys just age catches up with them quickly because of the, um, the way their muscular built muscularly, this guy looks like a walking hamstring pull. Like, <laughs> it's coming. You just don't know which inning it's coming. Um, yeah. Well, he's got to change his workout routine, no question about that. Well, which brings us to the training staff. And I'm hearing things like even Ron Darling uh, yep. came out with yep. something that being critical. It's I'm when a fan, a uh, 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 a fan who, like myself, who really doesn't know the insides, who's a good trainer and who's not. But you see the results. I, Whatever they're doing, he, I would have said at the beginning of this year, the odds were astronomically in their favor because of the previous two years' injuries. you got to figure it's all going to even out. It's going to catch up with it. It's going to even out with the franchise and mm-hmm. they're going to start getting some breaks. But maybe it is something that they're either doing or not doing. And um, so, uh, but then again, you fire your training staff. Who's out there? Who, which trainer? Whoever you hire as a training staff, he's not a major league trainer now. Mm-hmm. And I say he, he, I should say he or she. Because right, that's coming right. too, um, sure, and yeah. rightfully so. Um, we're going to have a, you know, women are getting into baseball. Yeah. Well, and look, no I, 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 a woman can't. Yeah, yeah, I think if if Collins goes, you know, and 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 the rest of the and the rest of the staff, I've said this before. I think every everything goes. If Collins goes, the whole staff goes, including the medical staff. You got to make a change at some point. These guys are just hurt way too much, way too much. All right, and, Bert. Uh, then let me ask you this: If you're going to, if you're going to, if Collins goes, if he goes, wouldn't it be better to bring somebody in, maybe a Timmy Tuffle or whoever it is you bring in, and let them get a feel for the team, see what you got, who's going to play for you when it um, on pride and this, that, and the other thing. Um, make that move, say, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Bert. Hey, Ralph. Guess what? I made it. You made it. I was, on the, I was on the subway, and uh, I couldn't get off the subway in time to get on the call. <laughs> well, we got Hey, you hey guys. How you doing? I, I, I just like sat on, and I was Rose. listening to... I... Yeah, Bert. Good, yeah. Good. How you doing, Marty? Nice to hear you, Jim. Great. Yeah, uh, I just I just got on. I was listening for, listening for a minute or two. I got swamped in a massive thunderstorm here. Couldn't get uh, couldn't get positioned. Sorry about that, guys. I understand. No problem no whatsoever. Problem. I uh, gave you high praise to Mert. You have um, did three things in baseball. You were a player. You were a scout, and you were um, in player development. And wow. Besides having the pedigree of being the son of the late Sid Thrift, who um, I don't know, Mert, if you remember Sid, the name Sid Thrift. Sure do, sure do, yes. 
Mm-hmm. Oh, good. Um, uh, discovered the um, came up with the idea of the baseball academy for Kansas City. Uh, general manager of the Pirates uh, in the Jim Leland years and the Barry Bonds years, and um, we're talking about Jim Thrift's dad. And Jim was a minor league manager with the Mets uh, and signed, I I think, if I'm not mistaken, Fonzie is Mertz, one of Mertz's favorite players as well as mine. Yeah, one uh, of mine too, definitely. (laughs) You know, I was going to follow up with uh, what Mert was saying there. I jumped on just for a few moments. It's a... it's really from the outside looking in. It's really a tough situation with that Mets situation. Do you, you know, do you agree, Mert? It's a, uh, you know, when you, when everyone doesn't play well, and when everyone gets hurt, then the last time I checked, you can't fire the trainers, and you can't, or you can fire the trainers, the coaches, and you can't fire the players. So right. it's a, uh, it's a situation where it's really easy to blame. Uh, but at the same token, in, in, in all reality, if you, if you don't have the horses, you're not going to compete. Yeah, but and I was thinking about I was thinking about some of that. They but they weren't trained properly. And well, I mean, it depends. I mean, the, you, you know, you got to realize Jay, Jay Bruce is Jay Bruce had some really good years, and he's you know he's almost a part time player now. Um, like you're saying, Cespedes, I uh, you know I, I, I talked to a lot of of the athletic side of people in the game still, and the worst place you can be in in any clubhouse is with the strength, the conditioning guys, the training guys, and the team goes south. But the last time I checked, the players are responsible for their health and behavior as well. And, you know, if you can't get these guys to perform and follow the guidelines of rehab and game day preparation, then they're not going to perform. Uh, it's just it's just that simple, and what happens is the strength the strength guys get under the gun, the trainers get under the gun, the players are responsible. That's what I would say. The players are responsible, okay. and if nobody's okay. holding the players responsible, then it's Terry's job to hold them responsible. Mm-hmm. And on if Terry's not coming down hard, anybody it's front office job to, to, to hold them responsible. And that's just you know, that, maybe that's the old school way of looking at it, but that's where that's that's where the leadership comes in play. And in, in today's day and age, can't, are, is management capable, as strong as the union is, of setting the tone to keep them in line? Uh, what with well, agents and what have you? Well, it's, you know, I, again, we've had this uh, hints of this type of discussion in the past. Uh, you know, let's revert back to my discussion. If this is a publicly traded company and there's 55,000 stockholders in the stands, who's responsible? The leadership's responsible. The people on the field, they're running around producing something, a win or a loss. The people in the front office and the ones behind the scenes, they're the ones held responsible. So, yeah, a lot of it falls on the, it falls on the coaching staff. A lot of it falls on the front office, but, you know, you, the players have responsibility too, union or no union. That's just that's the simplest way you can put it. You either want to play or you don't. Jim, did you hear our discussion when we were surmising whether or not, um, way, either way, if Collins comes back, it's not an issue. But if he's not going to come back anyway. Would the team be better off making a move and letting a manager get somewhat accustomed to the team and um, have some opinions on a, from a every day seeing them every day and making a move now to change managers if they're going to change managers? I'm not saying get rid of Terry. Well, there's, 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 there's two sides of that. You can change the managers or you can change the team or you can change both. So you're 10 days away from being allowed to expand the roster. So you expand the roster September 1st. Are you going to call up players that you think have a chance to be on your major league club every year that are in your organization? And who's going to work with them? 
Um, who's going to train them from August or September 1 to the end of the season? Who's going to be involved with them in the off season? Who's going to lead them next year? So it's a two, it's a double sided thing for me. I mean, right now, I mean, everyone in that organization, uh, barring any deadlines or post waivered moves or anything like that, is probably evaluating everyone in their system to see where their prospects are, see how far they're away, and see who's going to take them in what direction and see what they have to spend as far as free agents go. And, you know, that whole leadership situation, you know, is it is it the fact that the leadership didn't do what they could have done if they had a full deck or they just did the best they could with, you know, a very light deck of cards to play with? They kind of have to look at both sides of it. Okay. You know, I don't know. That's just kind of how I think. But if you're going to make a move, you're going to say, you're not just going to test somebody out until September 30th. No, you know, I didn't this person that. better you bring you know, the guy in and let him see the team um, as it is now and help him be in, you know, get him in on the decision-making process of who he likes, who, who, what they should do in the off season, who they should bring up. Um, hopefully they're going to bring someone from this system, a Timmy Tuffle or or what have you. I would have liked to see it be Jim Thrift. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to make uh, I'd have to make Ed Gardner Alfonso my bench coach. Um, you, you both could make, do worse. The Mets I could probably worse. have I could probably I have uh, Aaron Le- I could have Aaron Ledesma as my infield instructor and Butch Husky as my hitting coach. There you go. Okay. I just take all the I just take all the guys I manage in the minor league and see if they want to do it or not. <laughs> right. Uh, no, you, you, you know, know it's a it's it's a tough it's a tough situation to be in, Ralph, because you know you have to decide if who's going to manage a team. You know, managing and playing in September when you're out of the race is a little different than when you're playing for something. And if you're really out of things September 1 and you start this process, then that goal for September should be this is our spring training. And what I mean by that is that if you're going to make a move and bring somebody within that you believe can manage a team next year, you're going to tell them this is what you have to deal with and this is the prospects. And these guys that are bringing up are fresh and hungry and some of the guys are tired. And you've got to run this like a spring training and let me see your 30-day uh, schedule for the month of September. And you got to go right on the field just like it is, just like it's March. Then you have to work and train and play to win because it's a jump start for 2018. It's not, a, it's not an audition. Everybody's going to tiptoe around the field and, Try this and try that. No, it has to be a concerted effort to jumpstart your 2018. Okay. That's, hey, I've that's been having a question for you, Jim Thrift. I want to know if there is some common denominator for those players that you could look at, maybe in the low minors, and say, boy, there's one, one or two common denominators that you – that these guys share, that they'll make it. And conversely, can you look at a common denominator that talent notwithstanding, say everybody's equal in talent, a common denominator that players share that you could almost look and shake your head, this guy's not going to make it, just on your gut feeling. Uh, That's my you know. question to you as, as a scout and a player development guy. Every the, the interesting facet and, and uh, misappropriated concept of our business is that we have to have 20 people run around the field so five people can get to the big leagues. And that's what's called the minor leagues. Mm-hmm. And so you really have to take in consideration – who's your organizational player, and who your prospects are. And one of the greatest uh, lessons I saw of the importance of having 20 guys protect 25 was in 1990 
or 90 or 91, I was with the Mets. We shared extended spring training with the Dodgers. And the Dodgers had one fantastic extended spring club. And they were poised to release about 20 players out of spring training. The only problem was they had four outfielders. And so all four needed to play. Well, they thought, well, we'll just kind of rotate them and DH them and and they had bounced ideas back and forth, and Fred Clare said, no, don't release the other players. Keep them. There might be a surprise in there, and we'll have two extended spring clubs so Raul Mondesi could play every day. He was one of the four outfielders. So you see the vision Fred had? And that's really the, the, that's really the crux of how our business operates at the lower introductory level through the rookie leagues in through the full high A seasons, and then it dramatically shifts from double A on up. Because double A A on up can still possibly have an outside chance of helping your big league club. How how hard is it to tell when you're looking at these guys in, in A ball and I was looking through some of the statistics today, and almost nothing really jumped out at me. So, I mean, I haven't seen, obviously, any of these guys play, you know, in real, in real life or at the ballpark. I'm just looking at numbers. So if if you're a guy that's that's watching these guys play every day, and let's say the kid's 18, 19 years old, and he's not showing anything, but how how can you tell – whether next year or the year after that, maybe he'll improve and get better. Is there is there a science to that? There has to be something. The, the the only the only true science of it, per se, that I understand, which is the only language that I've really understood from the raw scouts' eyes, was in the early stages around the draft time. Um, the basic premise of scouting was you had the freedom to go sign players, you know, in and around the draft or the rookie draft or whatever you want to call it. I mean, amateur scouts could go sign players, and then there were major league scouts because amateur scouts saw minor league players too. Well, the the real crux of scouting was real simple. The amateur scout, he was out in the spring and so forth signing guys and that's what his main goal was. In the summertime, he would he would go run tryout camps and work out guys, or maybe somebody was missed or was a football player or somebody was hurt, and, and he was getting his list ready for the next year. And then he would get teams to go watch in the old uh, Western Carolina League or the 3I League or whatever league we had. I remember we had tons of leagues in those days, remember? Well, the scouts only reported on those players they thought were going to play in the major leagues. That's who they went to see. The same mindset of that scout carried the whole year through. So that mindset was, if I see it, I'm going to write it up or I'm going to sign it. If I don't see it, I go to the next person. I go to the next game, and I keep right on moving. It was clear, cut, concise. You were not inundated with minutia of piles of stats and background and video ad nauseum to try to find the needle in the haystack. That's where the science of today has is, is muddied the waters. So if you take that mindset, guys, and you went to a minor league game and – you were thrown back into a time machine and you didn't have a radar gun and you were, you had your nice sands about pants on and your white shirt with your two pockets in it with your lineup card and your pencils for notes and a stopwatch. I, I watched. That's good. I just had the power go. I must have had a lightning strike. I watched these scouts sit there and stare at the field. And gradually pull the note card out, make a few notes, stopwatch, 
and then they were off to the next one. It wasn't piles and piles and piles of paperwork. Right. It, it didn't exist. Is that, uh, to answer your question, Mark, you know, the science behind it, there really was no science behind it. Mm-hmm. It was the basic tools that, you know, we've talked about in our past discussion months before, what are the tools? And literally, if you'd go to a ballpark and you were timing guys running the first and doing this, you didn't see any speed, you might not have stayed at the game. Mm -hmm. If you were there watching batting practice and you didn't see many balls go over the fence and guys were swinging hard and nothing was happening, you might go to the next game. It's real simple. Remember, no radar guns. So you had to really... You really had to focus on the life of the fastball. Did the curveball really spin? Was there a third pitch? Was there a changeup? Was there a fourth ball, et cetera? And that's really as simple, you know, it's really as simple as I can make it. Today, I mean, the last time I checked, my last go around with the Orioles, there was such a wide spread of grading systems, you didn't know if a guy was a zero or an eight. Because if he was a zero, he was never getting out of rookie ball. Well, what are we doing writing up a zero? What a waste of time. But the only way to appease numbers is to feed the machine. And the machine requires data. That's how you get a, that's how you get quantitative analytics, per se. Well, still doesn't, I still don't know if you can really run, throw, and hit. And it goes back to what you guys were talking about when I first jumped on. Mm-hmm. Don't you remember the old highlight reels of Dodger Town? There were days in spring training started when there was very limited baseball total activity, but Running, getting in shape, ground ball, pepper, sliding practice, and drills. And they graduated into doing baseball drills. I don't even know who practiced sliding anymore. Did you hear a discussion on sliding before you came on? I heard heard you part of it, and I was trying to get on, but, you know, you know, Melissa, answer. I don't understand, Jim, why the art of sliding has been. diminished as it has why uh, I certainly don't understand why a player is going to dive into home plate face first head first or into first base because it slows you down by the clock Um, there are of course there are times uh, to beat a throw you know to avoid a throw you might you might slide but you can slide feet first to to avoid a throw too where was the art of sliding lost in baseball well we have to go sometime into the maybe possibly into the 80s when the ball started flying out of the park because we have not seen anything of the likes of blinding speed anymore with the uh, Lou Brocks and the Ricky Hendersons and the guys who constantly knew how to slide, slide hard, slide late, hook slide, pop up slide, slide by the bag and reach around. All that stuff is drilled, drilled and drilled over and over and over. And it was part of your spring training. Now, maybe it's the mindset, maybe it's the union. Who's going to go out and Get in the sliding pits, as they say. I used to get in the sliding pits. Right. Yeah, maybe. Well, they also, you, they, they also took know. away the second base slide. You know, with well, the double play business. You know what, Merck? You can't do you that what, anymore. Merck? You know what, Merck? That's an entirely humorous <laughs> discussion, different discussion for me. I mean, I I can look at some old clips how about them old clips of Griffey Sr. taking out maybe like Dick Green or somebody in second mm-hmm. base? Sure, <laughs> and, it happens and a, every, all the time. Or the, 
<laughs> well, when you're trying to win the game three to two and three to one, that's <laughs> you were just going to go slide and say hi. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, Don Bailey make sure the guy Don re- Bailey remembered you. Passed away, um, the uh, last few weeks, a former Met, uh, rest in peace. That guy could slide and break up not only a game, but a second baseman at the same time. You ask, you ask any shortstop who came up prior to even Jeter would tell you he played forever. There were some guys that you did not want to see at first base. And you hoped they stayed there and the inning ended. Because you did not want any six four three on that front on that side of it. Because hey, how did we teach them to avoid that? We taught them to do the old in the neighborhood play. Or jump and avoid the guy. That was all a part of the training. One one type of training to combat the other side of the training. So, mm-hmm. so when you take a look at, you know, to answer some of the stat points, Mert, I would go into a minor league ballpark, per se, in the Florida State League, and I would look at the stats and see, you know, how many at bats they had had up at that that time, and. I'd be up in the press box in some of the stadiums, and you could pull out the media guide, and this guy's played a couple years, year and a half. Well, you start figuring out, you know, at about the 500 at bat mark or so, he'd better start doing something. Because it takes about, on average, it takes about 2,000 minor league at bats for guys to really get it. That was always, that was always a mark, a line in the sand, per se. That was always a number that was important. And sometimes you can get too the big of a hurry. First, like Maury Wills, for instance. Oh, well, yeah. What about, you know, a, a, a recent one would be, you know, Denard Spann took every bit of six years in the minor leagues. Right. Up until the end. And, you know, you have to be of superhuman strength or power or quickness to reach a level prior to that uh, line of 2,000 at bats, but Sometimes you can jump the gun too soon and, you know, look at a player and he doesn't do well for you for five days. And, you know, you realize he's right about the four or 500 pat mark. He's getting ready to turn the page. Maybe he needs a, some assistance or some help. You don't know. So, Jim, are you um, you're so intellectual about this? Are you able to satisfy your intellectual needs through real estate, through your business, or is it? going to have to come down to someday you getting back in the game. Well, I mean, <laughs> any type here, any time uh, real estate business is, is multifaceted because it's working with people. It has a very similar process to baseball. It's evaluating the client's needs. It's assimilating and uh, putting pro- uh, properties together they may be interested in. It's gathering information on numbers and qualifications. It's, it's, it's very similar to scouting. And then okay. plugging all the and plugging all that information into the right process of lending and finding a home for someone that they can buy, how how they understand the ability to sell their home. And it's all negotiation. So all I'm doing now is if there ever is baseball again, at least I'll have many, many deals under my belt in the art of noting of negotiation and working with right. numbers and making two and two go. But it's uh Jim. You know, for the baseball you know, aspect of it, I mean, you, you, self promotion. Why don't you tell us, how, tell the audience uh, how they could get in touch with you, where your website is, how they could uh, deal with you. Um, I'd well, like you know, you can, could, like you know how we reach out. I'm, I'm I'm on all the social media sites. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. I don't have any blocks or any secret passcodes to get a hold of me. There are all my emails are there. Most of my phone numbers are there. Um, okay. Many many people reach out to me through. Sometimes I'll. Uh, you know what my favorite thing to do is, Ralph. This is kind of bad. I have a couple of really really classic baseball books, photography books. <laughs> what I do is, I'll take a picture, and not say who the who who the picture is, and I'll put on the Twitter account 
I wonder if we should tinker with this delivery, and I'll send it out into space. <laughs> and I'll wait a few days, and I'll find another classic mid, mid-delivery mid uh, picture of a guy <laughs> delivering a pitch, and I'll say, I wonder if we should mess with his delivery. Well, the funny thing about it is there's a lot of baseball guys on there, and they'll go, who is that? And I'll go, oh, it's Bob Feller. You know, the leg way up in the air, something, or the arm way back. Or my best one I put on there was uh, a while back. I put Lefty Grove on there. He's sideways, upside down, you know. And I'm sitting here thinking, boy, if one of these gurus today saw this kid, they'd probably have him stand up straight and tall and turn slow and be methodical and robotic, you know. I got another picture there of, of, of Ty Cobb on there in his early stages. He's all half bent open, the cockeyed, looks like he can hardly stand up. But um, I, I think uh, I really think that, that that historical perspective, and we always have to keep in mind as baseball fans, you know, what are we really looking at now that we have never seen before, or we may never see again, or Who's playing that's doing something for us that, man, we just want to take a snapshot? I'll say this, and I'm not sure who the hitting coach is this year in Miami. And I don't know if it's all the coach or if it's all Stanton. But whoever got Stanton to choke up a little bit and close his stance off and take hardly any stride with a small trigger deserves a medal. Because since he modified his stance, he has hit some god awful rockets, hasn't he? Yes, and he's on I mean, the block. I, I mean, here's a guy that's one of the strongest kids in the game, doing all this, and maybe somebody says, "Hey, Giancarlo, you know, maybe you don't need to do all that. You're so powerful now. Why don't you do less and see what happens?" For me, it's the only time I look at a highlight now, just so I can see that whole approach. It is simplified to the nth degree of perfection. It's amazing. All right. Well, and that's what, we get, that's what we get a chance to see. We'll get a chance to credit that coach. We'll look him up and uh, credit him next week. We won't forget. Yeah. And we're not going to forget it. you either, Jim Thrift. Thank you for coming by. We'll have you in kangaroo court later for your time. Thank you very much. I'll be there. <laughs> okay, you, you got to stand up. Yeah, we're court. I know, I know. I'm sure Mert's going to be the judge. I'll, I'll pay up. <laughs> uh, okay, um, it's um, you're um, you're terrific. I just wanted to tell you, thank you for thanks, guys. Thank you, thanks for having us, always. Mert. This you got is my it. Favorite time of the week, of course. Yep. Uh, I don't know if you know Jim that Mert and I went to the second grade together in. Um, at PS 148 in oh. Queens. Yeah, we, yeah, we, uh, I we know that. I know that. It's little kids, little kids. Yep, little kids. Yeah, we've been talking about I know that for sure. Yep. All right. Um, thank you both. And to everybody you got it, guys. Out there, keep, keep on Thanks, keeping Jim. on. Uh, Good night, Ralph. Come back soon and often. Uh, Jim Thrift. And, uh, you got it, guys. Always. All right. All right. Adios, everybody. Have a great one, guys. Thanks. Bye. Bye now.